The clapping. Wow. Well done. Well done. He had it. Yeah. All right. So we are, yeah, I'm going to try to try to make sure that we hit time. So then that way, Leon, you can get up here and do some Q&A and do some things like that and talk about what you guys are doing contextually here. Yes. So we're talking about the next generation. Um, and this is kids all the way through youth up to young adults. And, um, and so we'll talk about just, I'm, I'm going to share a few things that we're learning uh, just to give you some context for what we do uh, for those, each of those age groups. Um, I'll just kind of let you know. And some of you are probably doing something like this, um, but we've all got plans for how we're reaching them. But for, for us in our context, Equinet Church, um, when it comes to our, our children's ministry, um, and our, what we call, like for us in the States, it's middle school. So this is uh, 12 years old to 14 years old. Um, they, all of those age groups, uh, so pre-K and then elementary and then middle school, they all meet uh, on Sunday morning during the services. And uh, the way that their program works is there's about half an hour of content, so that's like a service, music, uh, games, those types of things, and then then the next half hour, as a part of their hour, they'll spend in small group. So we uh, we have a saying around our church that we think that um, life change happens uh, more in circles than rows, and so uh, we think that life change happens in the context of community, and so we start modeling that as young as possible. So obviously, um, babies don't go in small group, but then everybody uh, from the time that they're four and up, they have a small group leader, they practice small group, they sit in circles, they discuss the content. And so um, our, our time with them is intentionally designed um, in all of those settings to be uh, about half an hour of service and content and then half an hour of uh, small groups. And then the same thing is true for our high school students. So these are uh, 14 years old to 18 years old before they go off uh, to university. Uh, that age group, uh, they meet in the evenings on Sunday still, same type program uh, with uh, worship, um, so music, message, and probably some kind of fun game. And then also half an hour at least of small group. So they're also placed in small groups um, for that. And the reason why they meet in the evening and not in the morning is because we're encouraging them to serve in all the other environments. So our high school students serve in kids and in middle school. Uh, they can also serve in other areas around the church, but we're encouraging them. Uh, we want to have a culture of serving. And so they're jumping in and getting active uh, early. And so they're, they're serving all around the church. As a matter of fact, at Gwinnett Church, um, we could not do Sunday morning with all of those environments without our high schoolers serving. Uh, there's so many of them that, that get involved. And so then their program is then, and then for us, for our young adults, um, we, we change it up. We meet less frequently with our young adults. This is our 18 to now 30 because young adult just seems to keep going now. It just is going and going and going. And so, yeah, so uh, so we go, <laughs> yeah, it's just a never ending story. I know it's a young adults next year will be until 40. And so, um, and so exactly. Yeah. Feeling youthful, right? It's, yeah. Age is just the state of mind. And so, um, but so, so 18 to 30 is, uh, is our, our young adults ministry, and uh, they meet once a month. And the reason why they don't meet as frequently, uh, we do it once a month because we tell them, uh, you, you've got to learn at some point to be a part of the life of the local church. And so uh, your ministry, where all the other ones are catered environments for our young adults, we do it once a month. And the reason why we do it once a month is we're telling them this is supplement, not meal. We want you to connect with people in your season, in your stage of life, but then we want you guys to start learning how to get involved in the life of the local church. And so, um, so that's, we meet with them once a month. We provide a service for them, uh, music, message, and groups, all of that, uh, the same, uh, but their small groups will meet uh, off hour. So they'll have an hour-long service, and then, uh, and then their groups meet in homes uh, throughout the week, much mirroring what our adults do. What, are, what everybody else in the church does. And so, uh, so those are the things that we're doing right now programmatically. Uh, what I want to spend the, the, the rest of my time here is I just want to point out three things that we're learning 
as far as reaching the next generation. So just three things that we're learning, and, and I'll be quick. And if you do have questions, um, but then also, Leon, you'll get up here, and, and y'all will contextualize how you're doing some of this here. But three things that we're learning as we're doing some of this um, uh, with uh, reaching the next gen. First thing, authenticity is currency. And when I say that, I mean, uh, uh, here's how I wrote it in my notes. It used to be that what people were looking for, especially next gen, was cultural relevance delivered with excellence. Now, what we're finding is that when it comes to the next gen, what they want is emotional relevance delivered with authenticity. I'll, I'll repeat that. It used to be what young people were looking for is cultural relevance delivered with excellence. Now, what we're finding with the next generation is they want emotional relevance delivered with authenticity. They are less impressed with the show, simply put. And authenticity, real, trumps cool. Real trumps cool. Now, I, got, I, I feel like I need to point this out. That's not an excuse to be lazy or unprepared. It's not an excuse to lower your standards. As we've spoken about, we want our churches to be uh, come and see cultures, irresistible environments. We want it to be places where people enjoy and they want to come back. So certainly, we want you to be excellent. But you need to remember that excellence is, is not just more lasers, hazers, and lights, right? It, excellence is not necessarily just a, a, a cooler show. Excellence is doing the best you can with what you have. And it's doing the best that you can to reach your audience. And so, um, uh, so excellence is certainly not perfection and it's certainly not plastic. It's prayerfully, authentically, and intentionally doing your best in order to give people uh, that, that you've been given in order to help people to connect with Jesus and each other. And so the next generation, what we're learning, they, they're just looking for something real. And so um, in, in our teaching reviews now, especially when it comes to uh, our youth pastors, our, our kids pastors, and our young adults uh, communicators, um, in our teaching reviews, we're consistently thinking through the lens of and giving feedback through the lens of, were you real? Were you honest? Were you willing to address real issues and concerns were you willing slash able to appropriately share your own struggles and tensions? And when I say appropriately share, that means like obviously, you know, you've seen the person that overshares and you're like, whoa, too real. Uh, you need to be in counseling. And so there's, there's, there's too real, but then there's also, there's an appropriate amount of vulnerability that's required to be authentic. People need to know that you've had doubts too. People need to know that you've struggled with that too. People need to know in the areas where you go, hey, I read that and I didn't understand it either. Like, like there's this appropriate, hey, I, 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 let me tell you like what, how I'm currently wrestling with this in my own life, right? Like this appropriate uh, level uh, of, trans, uh, of transparency and vulnerability. Um, and, and then another thing that we're constantly thinking, how do we create moments where people can experience something in the word that we've been using, transcendent? How do we create moments where people can experience something transcendent, where they can feel something, right? I, uh, I mentioned to you guys my brother earlier, and uh, my brother, when he came, he came this past year, and he actually said, hey, I'm going to go to your Christmas service. And I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. He said, hey, just do me a favor. Don't hide Jesus. And I was like, what? And he was like, I want to know if it's real. I want to see if it works. I want to know if prayer works. I want to, I want to feel something, you know? He's like, so, so don't hide it for my sake. You know, he know he like, he's like, don't, don't hide it. And I'm like, oh, wow. Because he, he's, he's speaking to what a lot of the next, hey, we want to feel something. We want to know if it's real. Like, there's a real living God. Does it feel like he's present with us, right? And so what, what are the moments where we can, where we can create hopefully moments where the transcendent is able to, Duncan was calling it thin places. Thin places. When we say thin places, that thin veil between, between heaven and earth, right? Like where it feels thin, God feels near. Um, and so, yeah, how, uh, were, were people able to feel something creating space in our service? This means creating spaces in our services for response, for reflection, for prayer, you know, being a church for unchurched people doesn't mean we have to shy away from those things. It means we have to explain them better. 
So, so sometimes we think, oh, if we're going to be a church that reaches unchurched people, that means we can't have prayer moments or we can't have, you know, sacraments or we got we to shy away from some of the things that, that, uh, that, that could potentially be weird. It doesn't mean you don't do those things. It means you seek to explain them in language that an unchurched person can grasp. And so you just lower the rungs on the ladder. So that's that. So they, they want to unchurch people. The more like all the studies are so they want you to open up the Bible, but they want you to explain it. They want you to do these things. They want you to have prayer moments, but explain to them what's going on and what we're doing, and give them permission not to participate. That's okay. And so uh, this is what this, these are the things that we're thinking through and and, and we're learning um, in in regards to that. It doesn't have to be awkward if we can, if we clearly explain what's going on in terms that they can understand and if we give them permission not to participate. Um, and then uh, something that we're finding that helps us to raise the authenticity in some of our services because the reality is uh, some of us may not have uh, a struggle in that area. So don't make one up. That's not authentic either, right? Like, yeah, I also struggle with that, right? Like, so um, uh, what we're finding is um, there's power in leveraging uh, real stories of life change in your services, uh, testimonials of how following Jesus has impacted somebody's life. Um, for us, in our context, uh, for, for a lot of years, it's been that, um, that the only way to do that was in baptisms. Those seem to be the only times we shared stories were in the baptism moments. And, um, and those were amazing and they were powerful. Um, but then either if you're not baptizing as many people or as often, or if the only stories that get shared are just the baptism stories, then people don't get to hear the stories of what happens after as you continue to follow Jesus and people's stories grow and somebody gets baptized and then they fall off again and then they have a story of redemption where, hey, I was following Jesus and then I got back into that addiction, but then he's continued to be faithful, right? And so... Um, so those stories of life change, we're trying to figure out ways, and the more we leverage that, you guys, the more uh, young people are leaning in. We actually, uh, in our student ministry at Gwinnett Church, um, we started doing this uh, a few years ago where the, su the Sunday after Thanksgiving in the States was like very low attended because everybody went on vacation and they went to go be with family. And so often that was very low attended. And so we thought we're going to do something different and, and see what that does for our students. We're going to do a stories night when they get back from Thanksgiving, the Sunday they get back from Thanksgiving. And so that night, the whole night, there was no sermon. It was just student stories with worship. And, um, and that night, it ended up being and has continued to be one of our highest attended now Sundays. And the reason why is because students show up for each other. And you see it all over. You see it like uh, right now, young people, um, they want to show signs of solidarity for their friends. You see it in all the, all the social justice and all those kinds of things. Like they, they want to show up for their friends. Hey, I've got your back. And so you, we find so many unchurched kids come on the stories night that never came before. And the reason why is because their friends said, hey, I'm sharing my story. Do you want to come and hear it? And they're like, I don't believe anything that you believe, but I'm showing up for you. I got your back. So the room is packed. But it's so real. It's so raw. It's authentic. We obviously coach these kids up and help them to be able to write their story out so we're not just giving people. It's not open mic night. You know what I mean? Like, ah, yeah, that would be terrifying. But, but we had these kids. We, we coached them. We, we, we helped them to, to write their story out, and they communicated. It was beautiful. And, uh, and we've continued to do that, and we've actually found it to be so powerful. We're now, we actually took one of our worship nights that we do as a church. We do a few worship nights a year as a, as a whole church, and we've taken one of those, and it's now devoted to stories. And we do intergenerational, like across generations, multi-generational stories. Um, and so we have stories from an from, uh, 81-year-old guy named Paul McFall sharing his story of God's faithfulness when he lost his wife during COVID, all the way down to a 7-year-old getting baptized. You know what I mean? And so it's, it's, it's incredible, um, the stories and how they're connecting and, and helping us to be more authentic. Um, a, another thing that we're thinking about as far as authenticity is uh, adding some Q&A time um, at the end uh, of, of messages on Sunday or at the end of specific messages on Sunday um, and because they want to dialogue. Next generation wants to, they want authentically to know, hey, can we, can we talk about this? I have a question. And, um, and this is something that uh, Tim Keller did uh, when he first planted Redeemer in Manhattan. Uh, every Sunday, he would sit and he would say, hey, for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to sit right down here. And if you have questions, you're welcome to stay. 
And then there's another pastor right now in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. His name's Adam Weber. Uh, he's a brilliant leader, and he's been doing this, and he does, he does it at the end of each series. He does a, a Q&A moment. And uh, so, so he dismisses the church, but hey, if you'd like to ask questions about what we just talked about and you wanna know more, I'm gonna be here for the next half hour. And now he does it through an app where people submit and they kind of, you know, like that way uh, he doesn't get too kooky of questions. But, um, but he, yeah, he, he sits there and, and does Q&A and dialogues and he says the people that are staying are 18 to 25. They're the ones that want to dig in and want to know. So, um, so authenticity, right? Even if, even if people don't believe what we believe, there should be no doubt that we believe it in the, in the way that we present it, in the way that we live our faith, in the way that we talk about it. Um, it should be sincere um, and so that we don't appear as hypocrites. So authenticity, huge. It's currency for the next generation. Next thing that we're learning, community counts more than ever. Community counts more than ever. The reason why we say this is, and, and it's funny, it was this way for a while and it was moving this way for a while, but COVID, um, COVID accentuated it and made everybody even more aware of it. Content, good content is accessible everywhere, but genuine community is rare. Content's everywhere. They can get, if they want to know about Jesus, all they got to do is Google it and they can watch a sermon. But genuine community is rare. Genuine life-giving relationships with people that care about you and ask uh, hard questions and encourage you and, and things like that. And so community counts, time, heart, attention, a place to belong and, and a chance to actually connect with people. One of the number one questions that we get uh, from young people at our church is, hey, where can I get a mentor? These are our 18 to 30s. And they're like, do you know anybody? Like, I, my parents never taught me how to do my taxes. Like, I don't know how to do these things. They're, and they're going like, do you know of anybody that can mentor me? And so what we're trying to do right now is, is lean into our, uh, we call them our life after 50 group. So all of our 50 plus, and we're getting them all together. And we're saying, hey, all of our 50 plus, there's a bunch of 18 to 30s over here. Would you come and, and pour into them? Would you give a little bit of your time and connect with them? And they're craving it. They want that genuine, they want genuine connection. They want community um, in our services, the way we're thinking about this, you guys. Kara Powell, uh, she, in her book, Growing Young, uh, she says, uh, she calls it creating warmth in our gathering. Warmth in our gatherings. And when she says uh, warmth in the gatherings, she says uh, that we should be thinking about prioritizing chances to connect, have conversations, and grow together both in and out of service. So personal connections, personal follow-up. We just we, we had a goal this year uh, to grow our church because we'd been actually in a decline attendance-wise. And we were like, hey, we want to see more active adults in our church. And one of the biggest things that made a difference, it wasn't anything crazy radical. It was people following up with people who had come for the first time personally. Picking up the phone, giving them a call, thank you so much, remembering their name from Sunday. One of the ways that we're uh, helping people get connected and creating warm environments in our, in our Sunday services is we're doing this thing, uh, and, and this is what I've, I've been calling it, it's uh, guerrilla guest services. And when I say gorilla, I'm not like, ooh, ooh, ooh. You know what I mean? I'm talking about like under the radar, right? Like, like people not wearing a T-shirt or uh, a, a name badge. What we've done is we've identified some of our guest service uh, people, uh, people that are really, they, and they sit in the same spot, right? When they're not serving on Sunday holding the door and, and they're just attending a service, what we've asked them to do is, hey, would you own your four rows? Anybody that comes and sits in your four rows, you're not in a t-shirt, you don't have a name badge. And so it's one thing when the, when the person with the name badge and the t-shirt welcomes you and greets you, you're supposed to do that. It's another thing when somebody who's just warm in the church turns around and goes, hey, I'd love to know your name. You look new here. I don't know you. Like I'm, I'm Reed, you know? I, and, and then they remember and they maybe even write him a note. Hey, it was nice meeting you. Or, 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 they, or they see him the next Sunday and they walk back over, hey, how's it going? I'm so, so glad you came back. So we're, we're, we're doing that to help create warmth in our service, some connections um, in, in the service, and, um, and also prioritizing pre, post-service connection time. We're trying to use whatever space we've got. We have a lawn space, and, and we're trying to use that for more and more hangouts and, and times for, for families to connect, um, and then obviously elevating and continuing to, to invite people into small groups, right? Small groups at every level in your church, because we think that small groups is what makes faith sticky right? Personal relationships. So community counts more than ever. So whatever you're doing around there, like we should be thinking about how do we get people into community because content's available everywhere. Community is what's going to make the difference, right? So uh, authenticity is currency. 
community counts more than ever. And then the last thing uh, that I'll leave you with right here that we're learning is that um, following is greater than believing. When I say that, I'm not demeaning believing, right? Following isn't, isn't less than believing, but it's certainly more. And the invitation of Jesus, yes, he said, hey, you believe in God, believe in me. He definitely said believe, but always the ending of his, of his invitations were follow, 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 follow. So we got to get people active in their faith early and often. And so that's why we're trying to offer them opportunities for them to work out their faith and to actually make it active. And so that's why we're encouraging our students to serve as early and often as possible and create chances for them to activate their faith. It should be our goal to do ministry with them and not just uh, for them. And a question that we, we should be asking ourselves in all of our environments, sorry, I know I've gone over time, is how can young people be a part of this? Whatever you're doing around your church, you should be asking that question. How can young people be a part of this? Not what do we do with the young people while this is going on? That's the question we most often ask. What do we do with them? How can we entertain them? How can we shuffle them off while we're doing this thing for the church? The question we should be asking ourselves consistently in order to elevate following over just believing is how can young people be a part of this? How can we include them in this? Can they serve at this? Can they be a part of this? Can they attend this? Can they participate with us in this, right? How can they be a part of it? Uh, because that's what's going to make their faith come to life. They don't want just something to believe. They want a, a lifestyle to live, right? So these are some things that we're learning in our context and in our church. Uh, Authenticity is currency. Community counts more than ever. And following is greater than believing. And these are some things that we're doing to try to help reach the next generation. So Leon, yeah.